Live Kabbalah is a nonprofit organization founded for the distribution of the wisdom of Kabbalah and its values. Learning the original principles of this wisdom can reconnect us with the true values of our society, including the belief in the dignity and freedom of man, democracy, and the freedom of speech. Hello everyone, we are in uh, this week in Parashat Itro. Parashat Itro is the peak of the whole Bible, because this is the parasha that, ex- that tells us about Mount Sinai Revelation. There is no higher point in the history of humanity according to the Bible that humanity has arrived and since that moment of Mount Sinai Revelation all of human history is to repeat that experience and to reconnect to what has been achieved on Mount Sinai. Now, the question, let's put it in the context. The context, if you do not listen to the previous week's uh, study, we have explained that the Kabbalists say that the Parashat Ito is one in the sequence of six Parashot, starting with Parashat Shmo, the beginning of the book of Exodus, that are called Shovavim, that is the initials of the names of the Parashot, Shmot, Shin, Vayera is Vav, Bet Bet is Bo Beshalach, Itro Mishpatim, Shovavim. Shovavim means rascals, people who behave irresponsible, with irresponsibility, which means us. All what we did in an irresponsible manner, that we hurt ourselves, this life or past lives, this is an opportunity. The year has many opportunities, but this is one of them, to cleanse ourselves and to create a better us. It's a better way to connect to the better selves that we all have within. And these six weeks every year are special days of cleansing, and that's why Kabbalists have special meditations, special prayers, fasting days, whatever, because they say the universe is open during these six weeks, and that's why we read the parashot, the stories, or basically the big saga, which is called the Exodus. Now, why is it important? So let's start with the Zohar, because the parasha, we can have many questions. A. What's so important about Mount Sinai Revelation? B. Why the name of the parasha is Itro? Itro, not just that he was not a member of the Jewish people, the, or the, let's say the children of Israel that left Egypt, he was a foreigner. Not just that he was a foreigner, he was an idol worshipper. Not just that he was an idol worshipper, the Zohar says that there was no idol worshipping, he did not try. He was the high priest of any witchcraft, idol worshipping in the world, that there's nothing he didn't try. So what is connection? He was, as we say, if we read the first sentence, the Jethro, the minister of Midian, the original is the, the high priest of Midian, the father of law, in law of Moses, heard everything that God did to Moses and Israel. So he came to Moses to join. Okay? So now, the Or Chaim HaKadosh, Rabbi Chaim Ben Atar, is asking, okay, so let's say that this is the father-in-law of Moses. So you give him some respect. So you name a parsha after his name. But this parsha. This part, give him another parsha, not the parsha of Mount Sinai Revelation. It's like a little bit too much. Moses. Rabbi Ezekluria is saying that this is closing, the, closing an old, let's say, an old dispute. Because Moses, the Kabbalists are saying, was an incarnation of Hevel, Abel, the son of Adam. Jethro was a reincarnation of Cain. Sipola, Jethro's daughter, was the woman they were fighting on, and that's why Cain killed Abel. And now, when Jethro is coming to Moses, and he says, when they meet each other, Jethro says to Moses, Ani chotencha ito. I'm your father-in-law, Jethro. And Rabbi Zakhlor is asking, come on. <laughs> He doesn't have to say that. Moses knows. But Ani Chotenchaito initials, 
א', ח', י', אחי, ברודר. Let's complete the old field. And I'm giving you this woman to be your wife, because that's the woman we're fighting about. Now, we know that the problems of humanity, it starts with Cain killing Abel. And now, there's a kind of a closing the circle of realizing that violence and dispute is not going to solve anything. And maybe this is why the name of the parasha is after Jethro. But the understanding will see it's much bigger than that. So the question is again, what's the value of this parasha? Why this parasha is so important? Why it is the top of everything and the most important in it is what's in it for me? What do I get from that? Of reading parasha Titro this week, realizing that in the journey starting from the Parashat uh, Shemot, Exodus, till today, it's the fifth week already, we're supposed to reach a level of something. What is that thing? That thing that we have to reach, that present, that this reading of this parasha is given to us every year again, it's just waiting on the shelf, would we take that present or not? And that's what we try to find out this week. Now, in the Zohar, Zohar Hadash, the Zohar has few parts. When the Zohar was revealed the first time in the 13th century, there was one bulk of, a, of a, uh, manuscripts that was revealed. It was printed. And then another bulk of a, a manuscript has been found. There were just parts of the old manuscripts, but few pages of every parasha. So, somehow, tradition said, like, leave it the way it was revealed. And that was printed as Zohar Chadash, new Zohar. It's not new, it's from the 13th century. But it's the next, it was new because relatively to the old manuscripts, that was revealed a little bit later, so that's called Zohar Chadash. So I'm reading from Zohar Chadash, Parashat Ito. And it says as follows. We know in, in Parashat Ito we have what is known by mistake, the Ten Commandments. So, this then, what is known by mistake, Ten Commandments, but it's not Ten Commandments because it doesn't say commandments. Nowhere in any book it says commandments. Commandments in Hebrew is Tzavim. It's a commandment, Tzav. It's called Eser Dibot, which in English translation it is ten sayings or ten utterances. Ten things that have been said, never commandments, never said commandments. And the first one of them is, I am God who has taken you out of the land of Egypt. That's the first one. What is a commandment or what is, what then? It's not a commandment. So what is it? You can't say it's a commandment because it doesn't tell you anything to do. But if you look at it as, a ten, as ten utterances, ten sayings, you have a different way and a different approach. First of all, the Talmud and the Zohar says, when you do something out of commandment, that's called idol worshipping. That's called idol worshipping. Why idol worshipping? A human being was created in the image of God. And that means if a human being is being created in the image of God, it means that every time that we allow something to control us, we're not God anymore. And that's why you can't call it a commandment. Because when, we, when a human being does things out of commandments, they lose the image of God within them. We have to do things because we want to. Because we care for because we feel the responsibility. That's why the Zohar speaks a lot about two kinds of people, the slave and the son. There's a slave of God and there's a son of God. The slave of God is somebody that does things because he was told to. You know, when you have a slave, you can't count on them too much because they do everything just to get by. But if it's your son, he knows that that's his business. 
so he will do everything like it is his business. So the top, the top of the ladder of spiritual growth is being the son of God. Because then you know it's all, you know, when you ask somebody, an Israeli usually, you know, why don't you take care of this? Why don't you care to, to take care of that? And usually, you know, in, the, in a speech of the street-like speaking, it is, why should I care? Is it my father's? And the answer, yes, it is your father's. Your father in heaven. It's nature. It's a street. It's your community. It's the economy of your country. It is your father's. And if you behave like it is your father's, then everything looks different. Then you take responsibility. Then you're what is called a mensch. Then you're a human being. You have the image of God on you. And everybody will see that. But, you, but a slave behaves like, it's not mine, why, why do I care? So I'll destroy everything, I'll move somewhere else. I'll take whatever there is, and when there's nothing more to take, then I'll go somewhere else, because who cares? It's two different states of consciousness. The whole period of time of these six weeks is coming out of slavery in Egypt. We are all slaves. We are slaves to customs. We are slaves to our habits. We are slaves to our nature. We are slaves to what we think the doctor said. We are slaves to what we think society says what we think people think about us. This is slavery. And as long as you are a slave, you cannot feel that you are made in the image of God. You can never be happy this way. So the road to happiness has to go through getting out of slavery. And that's why the Zohar says that there are few ways you can look at what the Torah is teaching us. Altogether in the Torah, there are 613 mitzvot, precepts. Now, many people by mistake again see it as 613 commandments. A slave sees it as a commandment. If you see it as a commandment, it means that you can never enjoy it. You always feel bad about it. You always suffer. You suffer the rules, you suffer from the holidays, you'll never enjoy doing anything. You'll be miserable when you're forced, you'll be miserable because society expects you to do it, you'll be miserable because this is a commandment. That's how a slave sees that thing. But the Zohar says it's not commandments. Commandments is idol worshipping. The 613 advices how to become a complete human being. If you see it this way, that's something else. Because, first of all, when somebody gives you an advice, it means you have the free choice to listen, to understand, to consider, to enjoy, not to enjoy, to do it with passion or not to do it, but this is an advice. Why is it an advice? Because one of the first rules you learn when you study Kabbalah, is there's no coercion in spirituality. Can you force somebody to be happy? No. Can God force us to be happy or to be free? No. We, this is something you have to acquire yourself. If you're a parent, did you ever try to force your children to be happy? There's no way you can do that. Did you ever try to force your spouse to be happy? There's no way to do it. If you try to do that, you'll pay. You'll pay for it. Politics is full, history of politics, full of people that try to force people to do the right thing. The result was always bloodshed and misery. You cannot force people to do the right thing. Because that's against the rules of this universe. Because the moment you force someone, he becomes a slave or she. And that moment, you're out of the game because you deny their right to connect to what they are, the image of God. So now, the Zohar says that in the first level, the Torah has 613 advices how to become a better person. If you don't see that rule in the Torah as an advice, 
to make you a perfect person, then you don't understand that. So reconsider, relearn, re-listen, till you find what's the advice over here to make you a better person, to make you a more whole and more complete. If you see it as a burden, it's not for you. You didn't get it. You don't understand it. You have to re-study, re-learn. And that's why the Talmud says that a person that studies three to five years, there's an argument, and doesn't see any blessing, he will never see a blessing. What does that mean? Rabbi Ashlag, the founder of, of the movement of Kabbalah in the 20th century, says, you shouldn't study anymore? No, he says, what the Talmud says is, this way is wrong for you. Why? You try three years, five years, and you're still stuck with the same fears, anxieties, hatreds. You're still limited. It means you do not, you're in the wrong path. Try another path. Because that doesn't lead you anywhere good. And that's why he says, when you study the Zohar, it will lead you to the right place. First of all, when you study that it's an advice, God is giving you an advice, how to become a more complete person. It's all about you to become happier. Because you were created in the image of God, but you cannot be happy unless you have responsibility like God. Nobody has to tell you what's right and what's wrong. But you can learn. You have to learn it by yourself. And that's one thing. Then the Zohar says, you can see the mitzvot as 18 in Aramaic advices. In a higher level, you see it as pekudin. Pekudin, if you want to understand it in Hebrew, when you go to, let's say in Hebrew, the word pakid. Pakid is a clerk, a, a government official. The meaning is somebody who is responsible for. Somebody that is put on a responsibility because it's his job to supervise it, to make things happen. Pakid is not just a clerk, it's above it. The word Pakid is, the word Mefaked is a commander. And there's another thing, when you go to the bank, and you want to put money in the bank, you, what you do in Hebrew is Mafkid. You give your money to the banker for his responsibility to control your money, to keep it, because you trust them. That's why it's called a trust fund, right? And that's in the word melafkid, to deposit money in a bank. So when you see the mitzvot as pikudin, it means that you understand, A, your responsibility, B, you understand that every action that you do is depositing spiritual light and spiritual energy in every action that you do, that you have responsibility. So now, Zohar Hadash, on Yitro, that's where it was all just introduction to understand that Zohar. And it says as follows, in verse 1, Anuchi Hashem Elokecha, I'm your God, as we said, that took you out of Egypt, from the house of slavery. It's not a commandment. It cannot be. Utterances fit much better. But what's so important about it? And the Zohar is asking. Shal Rabbi Isa, hakatan mi ben haverim. Rabbi Isa was the, the, the youngest among the friends of Rabbi Shimon. He asked Rabbi Shimon, I have one question to ask you. Yesh li shil shol shel achad mimcha, vedofeket li bilibi, and this question is bothering me in my heart. It dofeket li bilibi, it, it, it hits on my on my heart. I, I, I'm afraid to ask you. I'm asking, I'm afraid if I'm going to ask, maybe I'm going to be punished. But if I'm not asking, I'm embarrassed and I'm confused. I have to ask the question. So Rabbi Shimon says, say already. And he says as follows. When, he's, when you look at the first utterance of the first sayings of the ten on Mount Sinai that God says I'm your God that took you out of Egypt the house of slavery this is being mentioned in the Torah 
50 times. 50 times. What is that for? Why God has to mention that 50 times that we don't, that all the time, remember that I took you out of Egypt. It sounds like, it doesn't sound nice. Now, what kind of value does that have? And the answer, I won't go too deep into the answer. But it says in the end that getting us out of Egypt was not just taking us out of a country. It was taking us out of the deepest level of impurity to the upper level of purity and holiness. What does that mean? Is it a religious explanation? No, it's not. What is impurity? Impurity, when somebody, somebody's heart is impure, in Hebrew is tameh, tum'ah, in it's Hebrew in coming from the word atum, blocked. And that's the word of, so being an idiot in Hebrew is metumtam, somebody whose heart is blocked. That's why you can't understand why somebody's heart is blocked. Usually, when he's emotionally disturbed. When we are emotionally upset, we can't understand anything. Why? Because of impurity. Because we get hooked on to the pain, the fear, the fear of pain, all kinds of stuff like this, and that's what makes us not understanding. What does make it make us? It makes us being, in one word, being slaves. A slave is someone who can't get it. Why? He's too busy to survive. He's so focused on being a slave to the fear, from the fear from humiliation, the fear of pain, the fear of lack, any kind of fear, because that's a slave mentality. Slaves are people. That it says, you know, you can get the slave out of slavery, but still, they still have, he still thinks like a slave, and what you project to the world outside you, that's what you get from the world back. So, a slave is not just somebody that people abuse them, it's somebody that does not feel that they have the right not to be abused. It's a mentality. And the whole thing about getting out of Egypt, the Zohar says, and that's what Rabbi Shimon is saying. It's not just getting out of the country of Egypt. Who cares? Many people were in a country and they have suffered and they got out of the country. And they're in another country. But you know what? Same story. You see a person in a terrible, terrible, abusive marriage. Finally, finally, you know what? They get out of this marriage. Why? Because social worker told them to get out of the marriage. They take them through the steps and the stages and finally they are divorced, they are free. And you know what? Sooner or later they find themselves in the same kind of relationship. Why? You can take somebody out of the slavery, but to take the slave out of somebody's heart, that's not such an easy thing. That's a journey that every human being has to go through. That's the journey of Exodus. The story of Exodus is not about some kind of people that got out of Egypt. It's about us learning to get out of our slavery. And when, that's why it says, why the first utterance is, listen again, which is the most important of all ten of them. I am God your Lord that took you out of Egypt from the house of slavery. Why is it the most important of all of them? During our lives, during our day, we have so many, so many occasions in which somebody says something, we get a message, and the fear strikes, and the pain strikes. And whatever happens, and we get emotional, and we get reactive, and then this is the moment to remember the first of the ten. I am God, your Lord. There's only one God that took you out of Egypt, the house of slavery. I already took you out. Why are you going there again? 
there's only one God. Nobody can be your God. Not your wife, not your husband, not your boss, not the IRS. No one will be your God. The moment you hand over the power to somebody, you transgress the first and the most important of all ten. Then there's nothing to talk about. Because then you're blocked. You're already impure because your heart is full of negativity. It's called today emotional quotients, EQ. If you don't have that, when you are a slave, you are in total impurity. And the Zohar says, God took us out of Egypt, but He didn't take us out of a country. He took us out of a consciousness. He brought us to Mount Sinai after 50 days of marching in the desert. But it was not marching of the desert. It was marching up the ladder of human consciousness. When we come to Mount Sinai in the third month, why the third month is so important? The first month, the day of Exodus, was the full moon of, of Aries. We spoke about it already. Aries is a symbol of the human me. Me, me, me. The child. It's all about me. And when you're all about you, you're a slave. You're a slave to your needs. I want this and I need that and I need that and I have to have that. And I can't wait. And you know, when you're a kid, a year old, two years old, three years old, that's okay. But growing up means I want that. And you know what? I'll have to work for it. I have to wait for it. I have to make it happen. That's the difference between a kid and a grown up. A slave and the child of God. The child of God knows, as a child of God, nobody can do it for you. You should do it yourself and get to work. A slave is always complaining why they didn't do it for me. Why they didn't bring that to me. Why is it they, they do not allow me to have that? That's a slave. That's impurity. This is n all what impurity is about is about that. Because then your thoughts are impure, they're dirty. Dirty means there's a lot of emotional noise that doesn't let you see the picture. You can see the business opportunity in your life, but you're so messed up emotionally, you won't see it. You can see the most beautiful person in your life that you met, your soulmate. You won't see them, because you'll be so busy messing up emotionally, you won't see that person and you miss the opportunity. It's all about purity of thought and impurity. Impurity is being a slave. Purity is being free. Being free, that's responsibility. Which means, I am responsible to whatever I feel. Why? The first is, I'm God your Lord. I took you out. I already took you out of Egypt from the house of slavery. Don't go there again. Don't go there again. Transgressing this one. There's nobody to talk to. And that's why the Torah says a slave is exempt of all the mitzvot. Why? You can how can be a slave and connect to the light of God? How can be you be a slave and be busy completing your soul? You already agreed that somebody or something else is responsible for your misery. You already took off the responsibility for whatever, whatever happens to your life. How can you right now accept 613 advices? You're not the person for advices, you don't listen to anyone. You don't listen because you already agreed and decided that you're miserable and it's everybody else's fault. It's your parents' fault. It's the economy. It's uh, whatever. You don't allow responsibility. You miss everything up because you deny the image of God within you. And that's why it's mentioned how many times in the Torah? 50 times. Why? The 50 steps to get to freedom. It's called the 50 gates of holiness. And that's why from the first month, which is the child, the Aries, getting out of Egypt on the full moon of Aries, and 50 days later, that was Mount Sinai. On the third month, 
why the third month to be responsible? You need to understand that you have the ability to desire, to want, the desire to share, and to combine both of them. You can't just give whatever you feel like. You can't just take whatever you feel like. You, can, you should always take the desire and say, how is this serving the purpose of becoming God's child? Of being a brother to your other brothers and sisters around the world? Making this world a better place. If you don't see that in that concept, you're a slave. You feel like giving, you give. You feel like taking, you take. That's called childish. When you take these two, and you always learn how to balance them, like uh, juggling, that's taking the right column, sharing, the left column, receiving, and center column, balancing them all. That's the art of life. Juggling between your needs, other people's needs, what's right, what's wrong, what's legal, what's illegal, what serves the purpose, and what is just a whim. That's what being a human being is about. And that is symbolized by the third month, Gemini. What is Gemini? Two who are one. To two. What does it mean two who are one? You and the other person. Always balancing between your needs and the other person's. That's why when you ask Rabbi Akiva, or he the, the elder, teach me the whole Torah while I'm standing on one foot. And the answer is, love the, your fellow person as you love yourself. What was the symbol of Man's Son and Revelation? Two tablets. Why two? God couldn't write a smaller font and have one tablet? The answer is, the symbol of Gemini. Man's Son and Revelation was on the month of Gemini. You want to reach to be the child of God, you have to learn to respect and to love other people, the other, another human being. You're not by yourself. That's the road to freedom. That's the road to happiness. Getting out of yourself. And there are 50 steps. And that's why 50 times it's being mentioned in the Torah. Because that's the road to freedom. Not to remember. Oh, God took us out of Egypt. I have to say thank God, thank God all the time. How do you say thank God? By not jumping into the slavery every time. You have a shadow of a cage. And we usually when we see the shadow of a cage, we jump in. Oh, it's their fault. It's their fault. I'm upset. I'm miserable. Oh, it's a tough day. It's a bad day. You hear people saying that? What you didn't understand from God saying, I'm God your Lord. It took you out of Egypt, the house of slavery. I took you out. Don't go there. So. So why 10 other reasons? Why not 11? The universe is made, according to the book of formation, that is related to Abram the Patriarch. The Patriarch. To 10 forces that the universe is standing on. Ten sefirot, modern science says, ten dimensions the universe is made of. However, they have some argument in modern physics since 1984, if these are ten dimensions or nine, ten or eleven. Abraham, 4,000 years ago, said, ten not eleven, ten not nine. You know, you make the mistake, remember, it's ten. So, it's all starting with Genesis chapter 1. And it says, and God said, let there be light. In Genesis chapter 1, ten times it says, and God said. And the Kabbalists will ask, God said, does he have a mouth? No. How did he say? Does he have a tongue? No. Does he have a language? That we know? No. So, was there air? No. So how could God say? And that is the language of Kabbalah. What he says in the Bible, in the Torah, the, the, sign, the uh, sages are saying, this is our language. We cannot understand God's language. We have our language. But this language is a reflection of God's language. When somebody says something, 
he utters something, he brings out an idea, an emotion, energy. God did not say anything. God, simply when you have an idea, you have a story. What do you mean you have a story? You have an emotion, and you want to deliver that emotion. How do you deliver that emotion? By telling a story. That means God said. When God said, let there be this and let there be that, God gave this universe ten breaths of life. These are called the ten sefirot, the tree of life. That's what this universe is built of. After Cain killed Abel, and then the rest of humanity for generations and generations started to make each other miserable because blaming each other for their misery. What the Kabbalists are saying every time you hurt somebody, you hurt yourself and you hurt the whole universe, the creation of God. And this hurt, although we don't see it by our eyes, stays. It's a pollution. You don't see when you smoke a cigarette or when your car is driving, you don't see how the universe is, how the world is becoming polluted. Now we can start to understand how we can pollute the world, get the world stuffed and suffocated without seeing that. Energetically, it happens the same. The world, by humanity's actions, start to be so suffocated that all ten powers of God, of life, the tree of life, the ten sefirot, the ten illuminations, the ten shining lights of God, that that's what makes it alive every creature in the universe. Everything was so stuck that humanity was all in the house of slavery. Releasing the Israelites was releasing humanity. And that's why it needed ten plagues to break the consciousness of Pharaoh. You know, Pharaoh in Hebrew is a word. It means, if you take the word Paro, you change the letters, you get Haorif, the neck. Stiff neck. Pharaoh was really stiff neck. God was saying, let my people go, and Pharaoh says, I don't know who's God. Which means, I don't know about sharing. I don't know about understanding that people are not supposed to be slaves. Life is about hurting other people. You know what? Still, humanity is full of people that they think it's okay to step on others and to be happy with that. You know, if I don't step on others, if you don't take what belongs to others, how can I have? That's Pharaoh. Pharaoh is the same also letters of Hafra'ah. Hafra'ah means disturbance. What is a disturbance? Really believing that if you don't push, step on, hurt, you'll never have what you want. That's the biggest slavery. As long as humans are slave and slave to that, humanity is, continue, is going to continue to suffer. And we'll see how, where it leads. So, after the ten plagues, basically it's the ten plagues as we said in previous parashot. A person has to go through plagues in order to release himself. Why? Because his body consciousness, selfishness, and negativity is our Pharaoh. I don't have to look for a Pharaoh. The moment somebody insults me, and my mind says to me, Oh, they insulted you! Look at that! You're miserable! Who's the Pharaoh? That thought that told me to be miserable. Same way, I can say, I am the child of God that take, took me out of Egypt. And who is this guy to insult me? And I choose not to be insulted. I choose, but they said horrible things. It's theirs, they said it. I don't have to listen to it. You know, what's, what's a democratic society? Everybody is allowed to say whatever they think. But there's no law that forces anyone to listen. Most people don't understand that. They think they have to listen and they have to get upset about it. It's like a written law. 
Who said you have to be upset? Somebody did something wrong. Now you're getting upset. Does that make it right? If you want to listen to what was done, ask yourself, can I do something about it? If I can, let's do something about it. Just getting upset doesn't exempt you from doing anything. And most people in democratic societies, especially today, they think that by getting upset about it and complaining to everyone around you and having these upset clou cl uh, clubs, you know, people sit together and they get upset about the government, about the weather, about this and about that, and all about all the culprits, but they don't do anything about it. What do you think? Isn't that terrible? If you can't do anything about it, don't talk about it. If you can do something about it, just go on and do it. But if you don't mean to do anything, don't talk about it. You know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. But I think it's not the whole verse. The whole verse should be, the road to hell is paved with good intentions without actions. Oh, I had a good intention by saying that, but you didn't have any action. So you better don't say. Because that's what slaves do. They complain. Masters, they do. If you want to shoot, shoot, don't talk. If you want to do, do, don't complain. If you complain, you have to understand, you're a slave. So, don't be, a, don't be uh, surprised when you feel miserable and upset because that's what slaves do. Disconnect themselves from God. Because God is light. God is a creator. You want to, have to connect to God, you have to be on the same wavelength. You can't be miserable and upset, blame other people and to be happy at the same time. It doesn't go. You want to connect to God, you have to behave like this, as such. Nobody is responsible for what I feel, nobody is responsible for what happens to me. I am responsible and I'm going to do whatever I can. Then you can connect to God. That's why you see that complainers are never happy. And the happy people are the doers. The people that don't have time to complain. You know, we have to give up all complaints, yes. You see something is wrong, don't complain. Okay, what can I do about it? I can't? Okay, maybe I can help get somebody else to do something about it. You can't? There's enough things to fix in the world that you can do. You don't have to be fixing all of them. And that's why the Sager says, Lo alecham l'chaligmo, it's not your job to finish. Aval, enata rashayli batel mimena. But you're not allowed to sit and do nothing. Choose something and do it. So now we go to the next of the ten utterances. What are the ten utterances? Man Zion revelation happens, the Zohar says, and we said it many times. When the Israelites, 600,000 men from 20 to 60, that means almost 300, 3 million people, because there were at least 600 women, 600,000 women, million point two, youngsters and elders, you have close to 3 million. They came to Mount Sinai, and as it says, on the third month, the month of Gemini, me and you, two tablets. How? It says, Vayichan Israel keneged ahar. And the and Israel camped in single in front of the mount. In Hebrew, in English you don't hear the difference. In Hebrew, for single is Vayichan, for plural is Vayachanu. Should be said Vayachanu. It doesn't. It says Vayichan, plural, single, as one person. Which means, by arriving to Mount Sinai, we arrived on the 50th day, the day we reached the consciousness that we are one. Love, we accepted the, con the concept of, I have to love the other person, because that's the way to be God. Not because they deserve it. I'm not an accountant. Nobody made me an accountant of other people's actions. When you love other people, Why do you love other people? Because God, your Father, created them. That's why you love them. No other reason. Just love them. Doesn't mean you have to agree whatever they do. 
But the same thing if you have, if you have your, your siblings, you have to love them because they are your siblings. It doesn't mean you have to accept everything they do. It doesn't mean you don't love them. Why you love them? Because you are one. You're the same family. We are the family of men because we are all children of the same father. Only when we accept that, we accept the responsibility, we remove all impurities, all negativities. That's holiness. Holiness means that you can clear your mind and you can simply love people just because it's the biggest noble thing to do. There's no bigger reward and bigger work than loving. But they don't deserve it. Who cares? When you love, you deserve it. And when you love other people, you can help them. You can't help them when you don't love them. Can't. More pain does not remove pain. So the first of the ten utterances is, I am God your Lord that took you out of Egypt, this house of slavery, fifty times. So we reach the fiftieth gate of holiness as free people. A free person is a person that is, he can love people unconditionally. Then you're free. There's nothing more fun than just loving people. Why? Because. But then this and this is so. Okay, we, so we can talk to them. You know, they'll grow. You look at your child. Are they perfect? No. But they'll grow. They'll grow up. You, tr you, you teach them. You give them an example. Every time they make a mistake, you don't hate them for that. Hatred is the biggest punishment that a slave punishes himself. There's nothing worse than hatred. It's poison that poisons every cell of your body. You know, when a person does something, something negative, stealing, killing, whatever, you hurt something in your soul, but hatred, it's, it's an anger, that's something, something that poisons everything. Everything. No bigger punishment than that. So the second one of the ten, is lo yelech Elohim acharim al panai. You shouldn't have another God on me. No other image. Do not bow down to them. Do not worship them. Because I am God, your Lord. Which means, what a punishment. If you worship the money, if you worship another person, if you worship your body, if you worship whatever you call it, you make it your God. Oh, when I have that, then I'll be happy. Oh, you made another God. You made another God. You disconnected yourself from the light of the universe, from the light of the Creator. You'll be miserable. Do not carry the name of God in vain. God is not a game. It doesn't mean you shouldn't carry the name of God. But when you carry the name of God, mean it. Connect it. Do not just pray because you have to. Oh, I have to pray. That's carrying the name of God in vain. When you say the name of God, you should ask God's help. You should mean that. Because it's all about our relationship with God. There's nothing else but our relationship with God. Everything that happens to us, if it's physical, it's your body, it's health, it's relationship. The moment to remember to have a relationship with your Father in Heaven, that is, the whole world is full with Him. The moment you have that relationship, every moment, and you understand that God is everywhere, you do not, you'll never carry the name of God in vain. But the moment you do not understand, you think that God is far away, then you just said, okay, I said a prayer. Maybe God is going to give me a point. Maybe not. doesn't work this way. You have to mean it. The next one is, remember the day of the Sabbath. Sixth day you're going to work. Do all your work. On the seventh day, the Sabbath for God your Lord. Do you know what is Sabbath for? The first thing is to show that you're free. That you can turn off your phone. You can turn off your computer. 
You don't have to run anywhere. You don't need to run to any appointment. You don't need to run to the restaurant, whatever. You're home with your family and it's day for the Lord. It's day for the light. Nothing else. Only free people can celebrate the Sabbath. Only free people. Slaves cannot celebrate Sabbath. They sit in the Sabbath and they end up upset because what's going on? What's the news? Somebody is looking for me. Somebody is calling me. They, you're a slave. Training to be a child of God is training to keep Shabbat. It's not keep, it's observing Shabbat. Why observing? It's a consciousness. It's not the actions. It's more about the observance. The observance means, do you know that some people, they don't walk on Shabbat, but they're miserable because they do not know that God is giving you in Shabbat, during the whole Shabbat, God is broadcasting the energy of freedom. What the Zohar is teaching us, that every week, Friday comes, just before noon, and the universe is starting to climb up, and it climbs up 50 steps. Remember the 50 steps? 50 gates of holiness. On the moment of candle lighting, it's a moment of takeoff. If you can stay there for 24 hours, 25 hours, you are a free human being. God is taking you Himself. You don't have to work for it. You just have to let it in. And let it in and let, let God and let in. Let go and let God. God is sending you that little gift which is called Shabbat, the Sabbath. And the Zohar says the Sabbath is the same letters as Bat Shin, the daughter of the Shin. What is Shin? The Shin is a Hebrew letter that is made of three vavs, right, left, center. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Sharing, receiving, and balancing the three, all together. On Shabbat, you can get that power to go on. It's like recharging your ability to be a free human being by saying, no, it's enough. All the rush, all the commotion, I have to, and I have to, I have to be there, and I have to be there, I have to listen to this. And there's a phone call, and no, 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 it's Shabbat. I, I'm in control. I can tell it when it's coming in. I can tell it when not to come in. And Shabbat came, and it's my time with God to recharge. God gives me going up all 50 steps, and I can stay there for a whole day. When Shabbat is over, it's landing time. But now I'm recharged for another week. That's why Shabbat is, the Sabbath is so powerful. Because you need to be powerful. The next one is, honor your father and your mother. So your days on earth. So your days on earth will be long. And that's also, it doesn't say, yeah, love your father and your mother. It says, honor them. It's not always you can love them. It's not always that your father and your mother were really role models. But you still have to honor them because they delivered you to this world. And they gave you all the tools for you to be who you are. And if they gave you the tools and some of them are anger and upset or fear, because we get them from our parents also, you have to respect that that's what I came with. That's my package. And that's what you have to work with. Respect that. Do not have grudge. Respect it and do the, do the job. The next one is do not kill. Why do not kill? Because the other person is the image of God. If you kill them, you kill the image of God within you. Why would you do that? But sometimes it looks like the only solution to my problem is killing somebody. No, it's not. You cannot bring light to the world with killing somebody which is bringing darkness. You don't remove darkness with more darkness. But if somebody comes to kill me, 
So the sage says, if somebody comes to kill you, kill him back. But you have to think about, then you have time to think, but why did you bring yourself to a place in which somebody has to kill you? And you have to defend your life. In the first place, you have to find your emotions, your mistakes that brought you to that place that you have to defend your life. It's not, it's very deep, but still, because in the moment I blame somebody that comes to kill me, I deny that I have the image of God within me. And I can make things happen. It reminds me, one of the strongest stories that I had from my parents when I was a kid. They lived in a village next to the Polish-German border in the Polish side. As the war started, September 1st, the Nazis approached very fast and some of the men in the village decided to run away to the Russian side. They took away a guy, an older guy. He was selling ice cream to the kids in this, in, next to the school. All the kids knew that this guy is a righteous man. Why? When dozens and hundreds of kids attack you, they misbehave. Because they want the ice cream, they push and shove. He always was pure love to everyone. The kids knew this guy is a righteous person. With a white long beard. He was a beautiful person. He never argued with any person. He never had gossip with anyone. He was always praying in his corner in the synagogue. Never doing anything of politics with anyone. The kids knew. He's a very high soul. You know, when you grow up, you don't see these things anymore. But when you're a kid, you can still see it. When those men ran away to the Russian side, they took him with him. His name was... His name was Rabbi uh, Dovid Danziger. But the Nazis caught them on the way and killed all of them, except for him. They saw him walking on the street and asked him what happened. And he said, they caught us on the way out and they killed all of them. So what happened to you? He said, I don't know. Before they killed everyone, they put them in line and a Nazi officer came to me. He took my hand and says, Grandpa, where do you live? I'll take you home. He took me home. Him and his wife passed away the night of Yom Kippur and Hebrew. So, when we connect to be the children of God, we connect to live a different way of life. Then we are free of hatred and fear. And then, different life is ready for us. The life of freedom the life that we don't have to hate and we don't have to protect our lives from anyone and we have to create that light because even the darkest people when they feel the light they go around it if they can't change but they simply go around it and therefore when it says do not and the others and the, it's the same story You should not commit adultery, which means sex is also a way to connect to God. But if, if you think it's a game, it's not. It's still, you need to be responsible to what you're doing. You have to respect other people. And we don't have that respect to the rules. You cannot take it without being punished. And what if nobody caught you? You are punished because you allowed your sexual desires to control you. That's one of the worst slaveries. And then it says, do not steal. Why not stealing? What if I need it? You know, nobody will see. They have enough. Yeah, but there's a light of God in every object. You can steal the object, but you cannot steal the light of God. If every human being will understand that, who would steal? You don't need a police. Why do you need a police? When people simply do not understand that. You can, you can cheat the whole universe. You can cheat the soul, the God within yourself. 
you'll never be happy when you steal. So it's not, do not steal. The Egyptians said, do not steal. The ancient Babylonians said, do not steal. Why God has to show Mount Sinai to say, do not steal? It's not do not steal because we're going to catch you. Do not steal because you, when you steal, you're not a creator, you're not a child of God anymore. You deny the image of God within you. Because if you want to enjoy something, you have to work for it. You have to create it. You have to be the cause for it. And then, do not lie. How can you lie and be God and be a child of God? How can you lie and still love God and love the God within another human being? And I guess the same thing when it says you should not covet your fellow's house, you should not covet your fellow's wife. You see it, you like it, get something of your own. See what they did to get it and do it yourself. That's good. It's kinat sofrim tam bechokma. Jealousy among writers will bring more wisdom to the world. That's what the sages are saying. It's good to have be jealous. You see what they have? Wow! What did they do to get it? What can I do to get it? Don't try to take theirs. The moment you try to take theirs, you're off limit. Again, you deny the image of God within you. When we were on Mount Sinai, the Zohar says, in the moment we were one, as one person, the skies, the heaven opened up, and we started to hear the words of God. But it says we saw the voices. Why we saw? How could we see the voices? And the Zohar says, the moment that message started to come in, all, uh, all the souls of the Israelites left their bodies, because the light of the tens of you that was revealed was too much for the body to, to, to carry. A whole nation experienced that outside of our bodies. Finally, the miracle was we came back. But then when it says that God, when God offered us the Torah, we said we'll do and we listen. It says also we had no choice. Why? When you're one with God, one with each other, do you have a choice? When you're on such a level, would you ever steal? Would you ever kill? Would you ever... How can I do that? When you're full of the light of God, you cannot do that. You cannot. We have no choice. But we have to come back to our bodies. We have to come back to the, to the body, to the physical work, so we can apply what we have just understood, that these are the rules of this universe. It's not that somebody wants us to do that. He can't be something else. Why is it important so much to study Kabbalah? Because you can study religion around and around and around. When you don't understand that concept, you think you're doing somebody a favor. You think you're cheating somebody. You can't. It's all about you and the relationship with God within you. There's nothing else. No other game, no other story. When you understand that and you can focus on that, you're on the road for freedom. And that's why when Moses comes from the mount, it says that all this was engraved on the tablets. But in Hebrew it says, Chaut al Aluchot. One little problem. It says Chaut with a Taf. And Chaut with a Taf is not Chaut with a Tet. Tet is like a T, and Taf is a TH. When it says Chaut with a T, it's engraved. But with the Taf, it's Cherut. Freedom on the tablets. Freedom from slavery. The tablets, Mount Sinai Revelation is freedom. This week is our connection to freedom. Is reconnecting to the freedom with, that each one of us, that's our birthright. So why call the parasha Yito? And Yitro, because in the beginning of the Persia, Yitro, that was the great priest of idol worshipping, he tried everything. And he came to Mount Sinai to Moses to say, I've heard all what you went through. 
and I'm here to tell you this is amazing what you've got I'm one with you I'm joining you I tried everything and that's the only way when our body when our friends when our society acknowledges I had enough I had enough of slavery too money to people, society, slavery, whatever. I'm willing to do the job. That's the step for freedom. But it's not enough. Jethro helps Moses to reach the peak. How? He teaches him how to teach the people. Because when Jethro comes, Moses is standing there all day long teaching the people. And Jethro says, you're going to kill yourself and kill all of them. You can't educate people. And here's the message. He says, if you want people to understand the rules, you have to make them talk about it among themselves. Divide them into communities of ten people each. Each ten will have a leader. Each leader will have his own community and each one will have a leader. You have to learn this stuff and discuss it and discuss it and watch each other and teach each other and care for each other. You can't be there like thousands of people, oh we love each other. You don't like anyone. You like the idea that everybody loves you, but you don't. You need the feedback and that's how you can learn to love the other person. When you have other people loving you, that you work with them you study with them. You can create a group in your working place. You can create it in your family. It's creating that group of people that always continue to learn this stuff, apply it, and support each other. When you go off track, if I have few loving people around me that say, why? What happened to you? We love you. Why are you upset? What's going on? That's enough. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I remember. But when everybody around you is sick with this modern craze to run, 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 why? We have to get where? Where? Where you have to get? Where? You know, finally you have to get somewhere. Where? Where is that place you want to get that you're running like crazy? That you have a heart attack almost? That you destroy your relationship? You have nothing. Because you're always running. You need to have that holy hour at least you sit with people that you love and you study this stuff together that you teach it out each other they can re reflect and when Moses taught the people to do that people love to love people cannot work without being watched because we need to have this reciprocation and he taught Moses how to make it happen the ideas can be so lofty but you have how would a person change to live by that by having small little communities of people that commit to that and study that and teach that to each other and exchange their experiences every week every day and that's when you grow why because you want to grow because everybody around you grow but when everybody around you is upset and miserable and blaming, you're being carried away and you find yourself a slave like them. And that's why the name of the parasha is Zito. Because it's two things the Zohar says. One, that when the negative part of you, your ego, your high priest of idol worshipping, acknowledge the light, how did it acknowledge the light? We all need recognition. So recognition, the desire for recognition is thou drive. So surround yourself with people that appreciate love, appreciate these rules. And then your Yito will push you to excel being the best person you can be. But if you surround yourself with people that are, you know, the race, who has more money, who has more car, who has more jewels, who is more negative, who is more assertive, who is more this, who is more this, that's what you become.
take your ito and enslave him to the, to the goal, which is being the child of God. Thank you. And have a great week. Enjoy Mount Sinai Revelation this week.